At the film's beginning, we were told two terms, keiju, which came from Japanese and meant a giant beast, jager, which came from German, which meant hunter. Then the film also explained how early aliens attacked the Earth from another dimension. The aliens did not come from outer space but passed through an interdimensional portal in the Pacific Ocean's depths. They came from the gap between two tectonic plates. The first kaiju appeared in San Francisco Bay. At that time, jet tanks and missiles could incapacitate these monsters within six days. But within six days, the monster's attack destroyed three cities and tens of thousands of lives. Then six months later, a second keiju attack hit Manila, Philippines. Then a third attack hit Kabul. Then the fourth attack and so on until the humans realized none of this would stop. Humans needed new weapons and all countries in the world united and tried to forget about competition for the sake of human survival. They created their own monsters with giant robots to block the kaiju attacks. They called it the Jager program. Originally, the Jagers were controlled by a single pilot, but the nerve burden of connecting with the Jagers was too much for a single pilot. Finally, a two-pilot system was implemented. Each controlled the right and left sides of Jager's body. With the Jager program, humanity was starting to be able to stop kaiju attacks around the world. But whether the Jager was good or not depending on its pilot, Jager pilots eventually became widely known. Then in 2020, the seventh year of the Kaiju War, two Jager pilots woke up to the sound of an attack alarm for the enormous Category 3 Kaiju ever seen. The two men were Rayleigh Beckett and his brother Yancey Beckett. They were Jager pilots piloting Jagers under the name Gypsy Danger. They were not the most intelligent people nor the champion athletes, but they managed to control the Jager and defeated the Kaiju because they both had the appropriate drift or neural bridge to control Gypsy Danger together. They got ready and got into the cockpit of Gypsy Danger. The crew also prepared themselves. Among the crew was Tendo Choi, who gave the information for Gypsy Danger from the control room. Then came Marshal Stacker Pentecost, who led this mission. Gypsy Danger's cockpit was finally installed on the robot's body. Before it could operate, Jager pilots were required to connect the pilot's minds through a neural bridge, or what was called drifting, which allowed both pilots to see each other's past memories. The deeper the memories were intertwined, the better at controlling the Jager. After the minds of the two pilots were connected, then Gypsy Danger could operate. The giant robot walked through the sea in storm. Elsewhere in the middle of the sea, a ship was caught in a storm. The ship's crew were surprised because suddenly, they were confronted by a huge kaiju in front of them. The crews panicked even more when Jager Gypsy Danger appeared behind them. Gypsy Danger took the ship and got rid of it, and then the fight between Gypsy Danger and Kaiju ensued. Gypsy Danger took down the kaiju before him by firing the plasma cannon twice. Rayleigh thought they had beaten the kaiju, but the fact was that the kaiju, which was too strong, appeared to have revived and shocked the two pilots in Gypsy Danger. The fight continued until it broke Gypsy Danger's left hand. The kaiju managed to rip apart Gypsy Danger's body and claimed the life of Yancey Beckett, Rayleigh's brother. Rayleigh, who did not expect this to happen, inevitably had to fight alone. He single-handedly controlled Gypsy Danger against the raging kaiju. On a snowy beach, two people were seen, a father and son looking for treasure with a metal detector. They witnessed the badly damaged Gypsy Danger collapsing nearby. Rayleigh came out of the robot limping. He fainted and was helped by the two people. Five years after the destruction of Gypsy Danger, Marshall Stacker received a report from the world's top officials who wanted to shut down the Jager program. They considered the Jager program to be unreliable. World officials said they would replace it with a Wall of Life program, which was more promising. World officials ordered Marshall Stacker to move all remaining Jagers to their final base in Hong Kong. World dignitaries would continue to fund the Jager program for the next eight months while the Wall of Life was still being built. After that, the Jager program would no longer receive funding support. Elsewhere on a Wall of Life construction site in Alaska, California, Raleigh, a former Gypsy Danger pilot, was currently at work welding down a wall that served as a barrier to kaiju. During their break, Raleigh and the other workers saw news of the appearance of a giant Category 4 kaiju in Australia. The kaiju broke through the Wall of Life in less than an hour. Walls that claimed to be impenetrable turned out to be very fragile. The workers beside Raleigh were starting to be pessimistic that the wall they were building could keep the kaiju out. Ironically, in Australia, the kaiju was successfully paralyzed by a jager named Striker Eureka, piloted by father and son Hercules Hansen and Chuck Hansen. Moments later, helicopters were heard from outside the construction site. Turned out it was Marshall Stacker who had come to meet Raleigh. Stacker invited Raleigh to become a pilot again. Initially, Raleigh refused because he was traumatized by what happened to his brother. Stacker again convinced Raleigh that the world would end and gave him a choice, whether to die inside the wall or to fight inside the Jager. 
Then they both arrived at the Jager Shatterdome headquarters in Hong Kong. Rayleigh and Stacker were greeted by an officer named Mako Mori. Not only Mako Mori inside, but Rayleigh also met Stacker's research team. They were Dr. Newton Geisler and Dr. Herman Gottlieb. Rayleigh was invited to enter the vaulted space where Jager's garage was located. We could see a giant clock above them. It was the doomsday clock that predicted the next kaiju attack. Stacker then explained that usually the place could accommodate 30 Jagers, but now there were only four Jagers left. The first Jager under the name Crimson Typhoon was assembled in China. This Jager was ridden by the Waitang brothers, the heaviest and oldest first-generation Jager driven by partners Sasha and Alexei Kadanovsky. Then Stacker took Rayleigh to see Hercules Hansen, father of Chuck Hansen. They were the world's fastest striker Eureka Jager pilots and the latest generation of Jagers to defeat the Kaiju ten times. Stacker explained his plan to carry a 1,000 nuclear warhead on Stricker Eureka's back and destroy the portals of the Kaiju in the sea. The other Jagers had a task to protect him. Rayleigh then became hesitant because they had tried to penetrate the portal several years ago but failed. Then later, Stacker convinced him again because he had a more powerful research team this time and was sure he would succeed in destroying the portal. Back in the research room, Gottlieb explained to Marshall Stacker and Hercules that the frequency of occurrence of kaiju was getting faster and faster. He predicted that two kaiju would appear simultaneously in the next seven days, then three, four, and the apocalypse would occur. Gottlieb had a plan. By the increase of the interdimensional portal tunnel traffic, they would have enough time to load a bomb into it and then detonated it. Newton looked pessimistic when he heard Gottlieb's explanation. According to him, Gottlieb did not have complete information about the portal. Newton had the crazy idea to drift with the kaiju to get full information. Stacker said that no human could survive drifting with kaiju. Stacker preferred the option Gottlieb offered. Elsewhere, Mako took Rayleigh to see Gypsy Danger, which had been repaired there. Rayleigh also met his old friend Tendo Choi. Mako then escorted Rayleigh to his room. Mako said that she dreamed of becoming a Jager pilot. Mako had perfect scores in the Jager simulation exercises but was not allowed to pilot by Marshall Stacker. Mako had prepared several co-pilot candidates to accompany Rayleigh to control Gypsy Danger. The next day Mako met Stacker and asked Stacker if she could co-pilot Gypsy Danger, but Stacker flatly refused. It was because Mako still had unstable emotions, and it was dangerous for her to drift. In the dining room, Hercules Hansen invited Rayleigh to eat with him. In front of them, the son of Hercules named Chuck Hansen openly expressed his hatred for Rayleigh, who was incompetent in the previous mission. It made the Jager program terminated. Chuck told Rayleigh not to mess up the mission one last time and then left them. After eating, Rayleigh conducted auditions to find a suitable candidate to co-pilot his Jager. Rayleigh beat the candidates easily and found no match for drift among them. Rayleigh was curious and asked Mako to duel. Mako was able to keep up with Rayleigh's fighting ability. Everyone there admitted that only Mako had a drift that matched Rayleigh. He wanted Mako to be his co-pilot, but Stacker still won't let her. After practice, Rayleigh approached Mako and wanted Mako to be the co-pilot. Mako wanted to pilot a Jager with him, but she couldn't because Stacker didn't let her. In the research room, Newton, annoyed, finally did drift with the Kaiju's brain alone. In drift, Newton saw the world of the Kaiju, and it turned out that his prediction was correct that the Kaiju were monsters cloned by aliens to attack the Earth. The next day, Rayleigh was seen coming out of the room to do a Gypsy Danger neural bridge. Rayleigh tried to knock on Mako's room, but he didn't do it and left. Moments later, Stacker entered Mako's room. He finally gave in and told Mako to try to co-pilot Gypsy Danger accompanying Rayleigh. When Rayleigh got into the cockpit of Gypsy Danger, he was surprised to find out that his co-pilot, this time was Mako Mori. They then got ready to perform a neural bridge in the cockpit of Gypsy Danger. Rayleigh and Mako tried to align their thoughts through drift. Then suddenly, Dr. Gottlieb entered Stacker's room and informed him that Newton had successfully drifted with Kaiju. Stacker approached Newton and explained that Kaiju did not attack randomly, but they were tools of aliens trying to colonize the Earth. Kaiju categories 1 to 4 were only the beginning. The aliens were preparing the final weapon to destroy all earthly life forms. Stacker told Newton to do another drift so he could get complete information, but Newton needed life and a fresh Kaiju brain. Stacker then provided information about Hannibal Chaw, who sold illegal goods of various Kaiju organs. Marshall then told Newton to meet Hannibal Chaw. Elsewhere, Rayleigh and Mako, who were now in Gypsy Danger, suddenly remembered their past. Mako was trapped in the memories of when Mako was a child and witnessed the kaiju attack that killed her parents. Mako, who was afraid to get trapped in the memory, made her accidentally activated the Gypsy Danger weapon system. All the officers who were there looked panicked. 
really tried to calm Mako down, and eventually, Mako managed to regain consciousness, but she immediately passed out. After looking for some time, Newton finally found Hannibal Cha. Inside Chuck Hansen's base, Raleigh and Mako were waiting for Stacker. Chuck was angry after seeing Mako's action endangered them all in the base. Chuck insulted Mako, and Raleigh, who didn't accept it, immediately hit Chuck and told him to apologize. A fight ensued between Raleigh and Chuck, then came Chuck's father, who separated them both. Stacker decided to relieve Mako in the office because of the incident. Mako then looked sad and walked out of the room. Rayleigh realized that Stacker had forbidden Mako from co-piloting the Jagers because Mako was Stacker's adopted daughter. Stacker rescued Mako as a child and raised her. Stacker realized that being a Jager pilot involved enormous risks. Stacker didn't want to lose Mako. Rayleigh then ate dinner alone with Mako. He gave the understanding that the first experience was indeed difficult when the two pilots shared memories. While the two of them were chatting, they suddenly heard a warning about the appearance of kaiju in the Hong Kong Sea, and not one but two kaiju appeared at once. Stacker divided the task to Crimson Typhoon and Cherno Alpha to deal with it. Meanwhile, Stacker asked Eureka to be back as a backup because Stacker would be in charge of carrying the bomb to the portal. Meanwhile, Mako and Rayleigh were ordered to remain silent at the headquarters. The three Jagers then walked toward the coast of Hong Kong to intercept the Kaiju, who were trying to make their way to the mainland. Elsewhere Newton told Hannibal Shaw that he was looking for the brains of living Kaiju. Hannibal Shaw realized that Newton had drifted with Kaiju. He said Newton had made a big mistake. In the Hong Kong Sea, Crimson Thaipun tried to fight against one Kaiju and Cherno Alpha with another Kaiju. Striker Eureka was behind as a substitute. Chuck, who couldn't wait to join the fight, saw the other two Jagers struggling. He and his father finally decided to join the fight. The Crimson Typhoon eventually fell, and Cherno Alpha was hit by acid and damaged. Cherno Alpha was attacked by two Kaiju simultaneously and then destroyed. Striker Eureka entered the battle and beat up one of the Kaiju. Just as Striker was about to launch a missile, the Kaiju behind him emitted a shockwave, killing the electricity in Striker Eureka's body and all of Hong Kong. Stryker was paralyzed, everyone was confused. Rayleigh told Stacker to take down Gypsy Danger, because Gypsy Danger was an old version of Jager and still analog that made Gypsy Danger was powered by two nuclear reactors instead of digital so that it wouldn't be affected by the shockwave. Elsewhere Hannibal Cha told Newton to take cover and bunker protection, because of Newton's stupidity, who had done drift with Kaiju, which made the aliens angry. Drift was a two-way connection, and Cha said that the appearance of this kaiju must be targeting Newton because of his actions. In the Hong Kong Sea, Hercules and Chuck Hansen, trapped in Stricker Eureka's paralyzed body, were desperate to distract the kaiju by firing a flare gun. When the kaiju in front of him got angry and was about to attack him, Gypsy Danger came. Rayleigh and Mako were piloting Gypsy Danger. The fight between Gypsy Danger and Kaiju was so fierce that Kaiju threw Gypsy Danger to the city port. At the harbor, Gypsy Danger managed to incapacitate a kaiju with plasma shots a few times to make sure. Rayleigh had Mako shot the kaiju a few more times. On the other side of town, it turned out that the other kaiju dug a hole leading to the bunker and targeted Newton. The kaiju tried to catch Newton with its tongue, but suddenly, from behind appeared Gypsy Danger carrying a barge and mercilessly hitting the kaiju brutally. The kaiju fled, and Gypsy Danger then chased him. It turned out that the kaiju was hiding behind the buildings. The kaiju attacked Gypsy Danger again and started fighting until finally, and this kaiju almost destroyed Gypsy Danger by bringing Gypsy Danger flying into the sky. Gypsy Danger took out his sword and cut off the kaiju's wings. Gypsy Danger was in the atmosphere right now and was falling from a great height at great speed. Rayleigh ordered Mako to burn the fuel and eject Gypsy Danger again. Gypsy Danger finally managed to land safely. Upon returning to the Shatter Dome, everyone there congratulated Raleigh and Mako on defeating two kaiju at once. Hercules Hansen and Chuck Hansen thanked Raleigh for saving their lives. Stacker also felt proud of his adopted daughter. Suddenly Stacker's nose bleeded, and he hastily left them. At the sight of the kaiju carcass, Hannibal Cha's men were in action to harvest kaiju's organs in Newton, who was after kaiju's brain. Hannibal and the other workers were startled when they heard the heartbeat of the dead kaiju's body before him. It turned out that the kaiju was pregnant and started giving birth, but the baby kaiju was wrapped around its mother's intestines and didn't move anymore. Hannibal Cha approached the baby kaiju and said the baby was born prematurely and would not live long. But suddenly, Hannibal was eaten by baby kaiju behind him, and finally baby kaiju died. In the Shatter Dome, Stacker told me he was exposed to the first version of Jager radiation, which was still rudimentary.
So far, only he and Rayla had survived after driving the Jager alone. Stacker then received a call that there had been another Keiju appearance around the portal and that this was their last chance on a mission to destroy the portal. Stacker then prepared Gypsy Danger and Striker Eureka to fight. At Newton's place, this time Gottlieb was willing to help Newton to drift into Kaiju's brain together and figured out how to destroy the portal between dimensions. In Shatterdown, Chuck was confused because his father was injured and he didn't know who his partner was to drive the Striker Eureka. Then Stacker appeared wearing a pilot's uniform. Stacker would pilot Striker Eureka with Chuck. But on the other hand, Mako disapproved of Stacker's health reasons. But Stacker still insisted on going. He gave a message to all officers that the mission this time was the last mission to cancel the apocalypse. Shuck, now partnered with Stacker, said goodbye to his father. Hercules, who realized that this final mission was a suicide mission, bravely let his son go. Hercules wanted the world to know that, at this time, his son was off on a mission to undo the apocalypse. The Jagers were launched elsewhere. Newton and Gottlieb did a drift with the Kaiju and saw what was inside the Kaiju's brain. After doing drift, they both looked worried and rushed to tell about the plan to destroy the portal that was in vain. Meanwhile, Striker Eureka and Gypsy Danger had entered the sea and tried to find a Kaiju Dimension portal to blow up. Around them, two Kaiju lurked at top speed. Striker was a little closer to the portal and in the control room, Newton and Gottlieb appeared to stop Striker. According to Newton, even though the portal was open, it didn't mean a bomb could enter it. The portal detected the Kaiju's DNA to pass through it. If it was not Kaiju, the incoming object would be thrown back, and this mission would fail. They must ride Kaiju to enter the portal if they want to penetrate it. During the discussion, Newton detected the emergence of a third Kaiju that was so large that it was the first Category 5 Kaiju in history. And sure enough, in front of Stryker appeared a huge Kaiju. Behind, Gypsy Danger, who tried to help Stryker Eureka, was attacked until his hand was cut off. Gypsy managed to stab the head of the kaiju that attacked him, but the kaiju was able to escape. The kaiju swam towards the jeeps at high speed. Gypsy Danger, with his sword, split the kaiju and killed it. Elsewhere, Striker Eureka was helplessly torn apart by Category 5 kaiju. The two remaining kaiju tried to destroy Striker Eureka. Gypsy Danger, who was seriously injured, tried to reach Striker Eureka to help him. But Marshall Stacker and Chuck and Stricker Eureka had the idea to detonate the bomb he was carrying and destroyed the two kaiju that attacked them. Stryker ordered Rayleigh to bring Gypsy Danger, who had two nuclears in his body, into the portal detonating the nukes in Gypsy Danger's body to close the portal forever. Stacker gave his daughter Mako a final goodbye. Stacker and Chuck then detonate Eureka's Stryker. The explosion was so powerful and by holding the dead kaiju, Gypsy Danger tried to enter the portal but the Category 5 Kaiju was still alive and confronting them. With propulsion, Gypsy jumped to grab the Kaiju before them until they fell together and entered the portal. The Kaiju wrapped around Gypsy and destroyed Gypsy Danger's oxygen system. Rayleigh fired a shot in Gypsy's back, roasting the Kaiju and wrapped him to death. Finally, Gypsy entered the portal, but unfortunately, Mako ran out of oxygen in her brain. Rayleigh then put Mako in a lifeboat and threw her toward the surface. Rayleigh was alone in Gypsy Danger, but unfortunately, it got damaged, so he had to activate the explosives on Gypsy Danger's body manually. Gypsy Danger exited the portal and entered the dimension of the aliens. Rayleigh activated the bomb on Gypsy Danger's body and rushed into the lifeboat. Gypsy Danger exploded and destroyed the portal to Kaiju's dimension. Moments later, Mako and Rayleigh's capsule finally surfaced. Mako tried to help Rayleigh, who was not breathing, and she looked sad but it turned out that Rayleigh was still alive, and they smiled happily. Hercules Hansen finally replaced Marshall Stacker and officially ordered the Doomsday Clock to be turned off. Meanwhile, it turned out that Hannibal Chaw, who a kaiju baby had eaten, was still alive elsewhere. So here it goes, the Pacific Rim Part 1. In the beginning, we are shown the flashback of the previous movie, which tells about monsters' attacks coming from the portal between dimensions located in tectonic plates on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. These monsters are sent by an alien race called Precursors from another dimension. Precursor intends to exterminate all forms of life on Earth so that they can completely take over the Earth's resources until finally the humans unite and create their own gigantic robots called Jager. Jagers are extremely big size that needs two pilots to operate them. With a struggle that was not easy, the Jager troops led by Marshall Stacker Pentecost succeeded in closing the portal between dimensions, the entrance of the monsters, forever even at the cost of his life. This is the story of Stacker Pantycoast's son, Jake Pantycoast. Ten years after his father's heroic action that closed the portal between dimensions by sacrificing his life, 
Recently, there are many cities have recovered, but there are many cities have not been able to rise, especially those that are located on the shoreline and are directly affected by the monster's attack. Unlike most people, Jake chooses to live a spree in a ruined city by the sea. To support his lifestyle, Jake steals various items and exchanges them for something he needs. One night, Jake and several thieves break into the decommissioned Jager scrapyard guarded by the Pan Pacific Defense Corps in California. He intends to steal the high-quality Jager parts because there are many parties outside who want to buy it at a high price for various reasons. Jake and his companions enter the scrapyard. There, they try to steal a part of a disabled Jager's power core. With his tracking device, Jake breaks into the scrapyard and gets deeper inside. Three people with Jake are seen pointing guns at Jake because previously Jake has stolen their stuff, and they want Jake to give them the Jager's power core in exchange. After entering the room as instructed in his tracking device, they find that the power core of the plasma capacitor he is after is not in place. The other three people seem to get angry and start beating him. Jake then realizes that someone else has stolen the power core before him. Jake immediately runs after the person who took the plasma capacitor while three other people are chasing them. They think Jake has lied to them. Jake seems to know the building area well that he is able to outwit them and lock them in a secret room inside the Jager scrapyard. Outside, Jake sees the figure of the person who stole the plasma capacitor. That person escapes and starts riding his motorbike and is after by several security force patrol cars. In the afternoon in an unknown place, the plasma capacitor thief is seen entering a room. A few moments later, Jake manages to enter the room which turns out a workshop through the window, and he manages to catch up with the thief with his plasma capacitor tracking device. From the inside of the room, Jake hears a strange sound and the hanging cords. Jake is curious and gets inside the workshop. There he spots a Jager in not-so-big size in front of him, and for a moment it makes Jake amazed. Suddenly, Jake is attacked by the person who stole the plasma capacitor from behind. It turns out that the figure is a teenage girl. The girl admits that the Jager is her handmaid and she names it Scrapper. Jake offers her to sell Scrapper as he has connections to people who want to buy it at a high price. The girl refuses his idea, saying that Scrapper is not for sale. While they are arguing, there is a sound of police sirens from outside have surrounded the workshop. The girl immediately runs into her Jager. Jack, who is confused, follows her inside the cabin. He is confused as the Jager only has one pilot's room, unlike the usual Jager which have two pilots. The girl explains that her Jager is a mini Jager so it doesn't need two pilots to operate it. Jake tells the girl to move and let him operate the scrapper, but the girl refuses. She begins to run the Jager out of the workshop onto the road. Suddenly, the scrapper hits something which turns out the police's Jager called November Ajax. November Ajax tells the Mini Jager before it to surrender as it doesn't have an operating license. The Mini Jager before it doesn't buy it. He runs and rolls avoiding November Ajax's pursuit. Scrapper manages to outwit November Ajax several times, but it doesn't last long as Scrapper is no match for November Ajax, and Scrapper is easily paralyzed. Jake and the girl who are with him are caught by the security guards in the prison. Jake and the girl get into an argument. The girl's name is Amara Namani. A few moments later, Jake is called by the officer as someone wants to see him. In another room, a hologram appears in front of Jake. That figure is Mako Mori, Jake's adoptive older sister. As Jake's older sister, Mako looks annoyed seeing her brother's action who likes to steal and create a ruckus. Jake asks his sister, who is an officer, to help release him from the prison. Mako is willing to help Jake on the condition that Jake wants to return to the base of the Jager pilot. Mako wants Jake to become a trainer for future Jager pilots. Furthermore, Mako wants Jake to go there with the Manny. Jake is quite surprised but even though he looks annoyed, he couldn't do anything about it. Shortly, Jack and Nemani arrive at the Moilin Shatterdome Jager Pilot Academy, which is located on the island of Moilin, China. After getting off the helicopter, Nemani wonders why she is also invited to that place. Jake then explains that Nemani has succeeded in making and operating a Jager. This attracts Mako. A moment later, Nemani's face looks amazed as she spots a Jager, Valor Omega, walking before her. The military also brought Scraper to Moilin Base. There Jake and Nemani are greeted by Nate Lambert, Jake's former teammate when he was at the academy. Nemani then realizes that Jake bears last name of Pentecost, son of Stacker Pentecost, a hero who risked his life to lock the kaiju portal. Inside the dome, Nemani is endlessly amazed as she can see various Jagers in front of her. She spots Titan Redeemer, Bractor Phoenix, which is piloted by three people, Saber Athena, the fastest Jager on Earth today. Nemani asks Nate which Jager he is piloting, to which he replies that he is piloting the Gypsy Avenger. The three of them are later met by Jules Reyes who works in the Jager technology section.
Jules looks surprised to see Jake willing to return to base. After that, she goes on to continue her work. Nate then brings Nemanny to the dormitory of the Jager's pilot candidates to join others. In the dormitory, Nemanny is coldly greeted by a cadet named Malakova. Another cadet named Jin Hai helps Nemanny and tells her that Malakova was jealous of her because she has to fight hard to register to become a Jager pilot while Nemanny can get into the academy that easily. Jin Hai wants to teach Nemanny Russian so that she can get along with Malakova. Moments later, Keiju is seen attacking the town. Luckily, there is a Jager Titan Redeemer, but Keiju is too strong and manages to defeat the Toten Redeemer. It turns out to be a Jager pilot simulation. The Manny cannot manage to do a perfect drift with Kate at Surish, her partner beside her. Nate looks disappointed at Nemanny's ability. Jake tries to defend her, but it ends up Nate and Jake get into an argument. In the evening, Nate meets Jake, who is eating ice cream in the kitchen. Nate asks Jake why he didn't seem serious training the cadets. According to Jake, this program is in vain as Kaiju has been destroyed 10 years ago. Nate then explains that the military is still researching the main purpose of the precursors to direct Kaiju to Earth because it is still unknown and to stand guard from the following Kaiju's threat. Jake really wants to quit from the Jager program. Hearing this, Nate then explains that tomorrow the private sector from Sheo Industries will introduce to them drone technology, a Jager which can be controlled remotely belongs to Sheo Industries. It is likely that the human piloting Jager program will be disbanded. Nate reminds Jake that he should be greater than this before he leaves Jake alone. The following day, a group from Xiao Industries led by Ms. Zhao Lewin and Newton Griesler, who currently works for Xiao Industries arrive. They are greeted by the current head of the Jager program, Marshall Kwan. At this meeting, Mako Mori also comes. She is glad to find Jake there. Herman Gottlieb then comes and mentions his old friend, Newton, whom he hadn't seen in a long time. Herman invites Newton to see his latest invention. Herman made a rocket thruster to get the Jagers into the battle faster. Newton says it was impossible, as the Jager is very heavy and it is impossible to lift it with a rocket. Herman goes on to explain that he found that if Cage's blood is combined with rare earth elements, it would be very reactive and generate great energy. Newton then says that Herman's invention is in vain as soon after being approved, Xiao Industries its drone program will be spread all over the place and they will be safe. Newton then leaves Herman. Elsewhere, Shao demonstrated her drone technology, which can be operated remotely in front of the Secretary General of Defense, Mako Mori. Shao plans to put her drones in all over place around the world. Instantly, several officers of the Jager program disagree with this idea because they are fighters, not employees. As everyone gets into an argument, Mako Mori and Jake walk out of the room. Outside, Mako states she disagrees with Shao's technology as it is easy to being hacked. However, most of the board members approve of Xiao's technology. Mako cannot do anything. She asks Jake and Nate to run Gypsy Avengers to become honor guards at a board meeting in Australia later. The next day, the Pan Pacific Defense Council meeting in Sydney, Australia is held. From afar, it is seen Gypsy Avengers approaching the meeting venue carried by several helicopters. Elsewhere, Mako Mori is inside the helicopter heading to the meeting venue. Xiao has also arrived there. As she is about to enter the venue, suddenly an unknown Jager from the sea appears. The Jager fires missiles towards the convention hall. Gypsy Avenger fights to stop the unknown Jager. In the middle of the fight, the helicopter that Mako is riding in is hit by a missile. After defeating the unknown Jager, Gypsy Avenger tries to catch Mago's helicopter but is unable. Jake, who feels devastated, gets off the Gypsy Avenger and runs towards the helicopter that is crushed. From above, it is seen that three Jager arrive at the battle arena. The unknown Jager sees that and escapes back into the sea. Inside the Moylan base, Jack who is grieving meets Nemanny, who is still practicing. Nemanny doesn't want to be left behind from the others. Jake is willing to help Nemanny to do Jager pilot simulation drift. Inside, Jake sees flashbacks of Nemanny's past memories where her whole family was killed trampled by Kaiju. Jake stops the drift as he is afraid Nemanny may getting stuck in the drift. Jake then receives a call to meet Nate and others. Inside the room, Jake is shown a message that was sent by Mako Mori, his sister, before the helicopter crashed. Herman finds that the Jager that attacked Gypsy had the code name Obsidian Fury. After Mako Mori's message is encrypted, it turns out to form a strange symbol. Marshal Kwan orders Herman to find the symbol. Kwan also wants to know who the Obsidian Fury pilot is. In the Shao Industries, Shao tells Newton to prepare for the launch of all drones within 48 hours as the Council has approved the drone deployment in the emergency meeting and sees tens of drones Shao Industries ready to be launched. In the apartment after returning from Shao Industries, Newton is seen talking to someone who turns out to be Kaiju's brain. 
He then goes on to drift with Kaiju's brain. In the dormitory, Victoria mocks Nemani's jager, which is small and cannot do anything. There is tension between Victoria and Nemani. Nemani then says something in Russian, which makes Victoria infuriated. Nemani and Victoria fight. Just then, Nate comes to break it up. Nate says that when the late Mako Mori was his mentor, she used to say that whoever they are, whatever their background are after they join Jager Troop, they are family and forgive each other. Jules comes relaying a message to gather in the laboratory. Herman Gottlieb finds out that the message left by Mako Mori is not a symbol but a picture of an island named Severnaya Zemlya, which is located on the Siberian Peninsula. The place used to be used to make Jager Core, but it is not being used anymore. Jaku is still angry over his sister's death, asks permission to take Gypsy Avenger to check out the island. The following day, Gypsy Avenger arrives at Severnaya Zemlya. Not long after their arrival, a Gypsy is suddenly attacked from afar. It turns out to be Obsidian Fury. Gypsy immediately chases and attacks Obsidian Fury. However, Obsidian Fury isn't that easy to defeat. With great effort and extraordinary fighting tactics, Jake and Nate are finally able to knock out Obsidian Fury. Jake and Nate are shocked as they open the cockpit of the Obsidian Fury. There is Kaiju's brain is piloting the Obsidian Fury. In the headquarters, Herman examines Kaiju's brain, the pilot of the Obsidian Fury. According to Herman, this Kaiju's brain has radioactive characteristics which are different from the previous Kaiju. The genetic investigation shows that this Kaiju's brain has been modified on Earth, and that it is not the work of aliens, but there is someone who deliberately cloned Kaiju's brain to be implanted into Obsidian Fury. In front of the hangar, Nemani and the others are curious and want to enter Obsidian Fury's body. Inside the Obsidian Fury, Nemani cuts some wires to check it. Then suddenly, Jinhei is hit by drop of liquid which injures her hand. Nemani and the others are shocked and then call out for help. A few moments later, Nemani is put in a room. Jake then comes and tells her that her initial action has made Marshall angry and suspends her. According to Jake, Nemani is kicked out of the program because of her action in entering Obsidian Fury without permission. Jake tries to cheer her up. As Jake is about to leave, Nemani states that she finds a fact that Obsidian Fury has technology that belongs to Sheo Industries. Nemani recognizes it because she used to steal its technology. After that, Jake tells Herman to see Newton at Shao Industries and looks for information there. In the dormitory room, Nemani's colleague to look sad at Nemani's departure, including Victoria. She seems to have reconciled and forgiven Nemani. On the other hand, in Shao Industries, the launch of all drones all over the world is almost complete. But suddenly, there is a disruption in the connectivity of Shao Industries drones. The pilots in the workstation look suffering. In Moylan headquarters, Shao's two drones have arrived. Right when Nemani is being escorted out, a strange thing happens inside the drones. Kaiju's brain inside the drone that controls the drones comes out. The drones then transform into monsters. The two drones go berserk and destroy everything there. The drones manage to immobilize Valor Omega and then drop Titan Redeemer. In Shao Industries, Herman meets Newton. Herman asks Newton to help him to stop Shao's drones that are going crazy. But instead of stopping them, Newton confirms the drones launching operations around the world. He admits that all of this is his plan to end the world. Newton has been planning it for 10 years. It turns out that Newton's brain has been possessed by the precursor since he went on the first drift with Kaiju back then. In some places in the world, the drones gather and try to open the Kaiju portal. Elsewhere in Moylan headquarters, the drones manage to fire the command room and kills Marshal Kwan. In Shu Industries, Xiao arrives and tries to kill Newton who is possessed by the precursors. Herman prevents her as according to him, Newton is still be able to be revived. It makes Newton manages to escape. In Moylan base, the two drones are seen still on rampage. One of them is successfully paralyzed by Titan Redeemer that turns out to be still active. The other drone then steps on the Titan cockpit and kills the pilot who was in it. As the drone is about to beat Jake and others, Shao successfully deactivates the drone around the world remotely and closes the portal. But suddenly, Herman reads the message that three kaiju managed to break through. Two of them are Category 4, while one kaiju is Category 5. Inside the Moylan base, Jake, Nate, and Jules notice that currently the only active Jager is Gypsy Avenger, and the other pilots are killed in the drone attack just now. Jake then sees Namani and the others. Jake tells Namani to help Jules repairing the remaining Jagers. Suddenly, hundreds of Shao Industries helicopters come to help Jager troops repairing the remaining Jager. In the meeting room, by examining Kaiju's movement, Jake realizes that the three Kaiju are heading towards Mount Fuji, Japan. Herman explains that there are many rare earth elements in Mount Fuji, and if it is put together with Kaiju's blood, there will be an enormous explosion.
The explosion will trigger a reaction in the ring of fire around the Pacific Rims. Billions of toxic gases will cover the Earth's atmosphere and all living things on Earth will perish. They are confused as they are too far away to stop Kaiju and are unable to arrive there in time to stop it. Nate then asks Herman about his rocket technology. Herman explains that the technology has not yet been tested. However, due to its urgent situation, he can prepare it. During the day, everyone worked hard to repair the remaining Jagers. Jules succeeds in repairing four Jagers. Nate looks confused as to who will drive the Jagers. Jake then replies that he has found people who will drive the Jagers, none other than Amani and her colleagues. Outside, Jake explains that it is not a simulation and whoever they are, whatever their background, they are family. Jake asks them to help save the world. They then proceed to enter the Jagers that have been prepared. Namani, Jin Hai, and Victoria drive Bratcher Phoenix. Suresh and Aelia are inside Guardian Bravo. Renata and Roichi are inside the Saber Athena. And lastly, Jake and Nate take Gypsy Avenger. The four Jagers fly towards Japan using Herman's rocket. Meanwhile, Kaiju have arrived in Tokyo going berserk and destroying everything in front of them. People run into the anti-Kaiju bunkers. A few moments later, four Jagers land. There, Gypsy and Phoenix attack the biggest Kaiju. Guardian Bravo and Saber Athena attack the two other Kaiju. As Gypsy punches the biggest Kaiju, Kaiju manages to absorb it and return it to Gypsy. Gypsy is thrown. It tries to hit Kaiju with the surrounding buildings, but Kaiju is still able to hold it. Elsewhere, Saber Athena seems to have a hard time dealing with the Kaiju. Just then, Bractor Phoenix comes to help Saber Athena. Guardian Bravo also comes to save Saber Athena. All Jagers fight with all their might. At the top of the Japan branch of Shao Industries, Newton takes something out of the building. It turns out to be thousands of small robots. Elsewhere, inside the Moylan base, Shao notices it was Newton's action. Those thousands of small robots make the three kaiju merge into one, transforming it into the biggest kaiju ever. It is called Mega Kaiju. Jake instructs the four existing Jagers to fight with all their might. When everyone falls, Guardian Bravo tries to charge forward alone. Unfortunately, it sends Guardian Bravo crashing and breaking into pieces. Ilya is able to survive, but Suresh dies from the attack. Now there are only Gypsy Avenger, Bractor Phoenix, and Saber Athena. The command center informs us that Mega Kaiju has three brains in it. Gypsy Avenger jumps and attacks Mega Kaiju. Gypsy manages to paralyze one of Kaiju's brains, but Saber Athena is stabbed and destroyed. Bractor Phoenix is also torn apart by Mega Kaiju and destroyed after that. Now there is only the Gypsy Avenger left. Namani and the others survive thanks to the rescue capsule. With the remaining energy, Gypsy Avenger tries to stop Mega Kaiju. It makes Nate fall unconscious. As a result, Gypsy cannot be controlled with only one active pilot. Mega Kaiju continues to head toward Mount Fuji. The man who Gypsy is having a hard time jumps and enters the cockpit. Nate got off through the rescue capsule. His position is replaced by Namani's. Both manage to drift and Gypsy Avenger is revived. Meanwhile, Mega Kaiju is almost arrived at the top of Mount Fuji. Jake has an idea to use Herman's rocket to send Gypsy Avenger to the atmosphere and hit Mega Kaiju from above. However, the location of the remaining rocket is far away. Surprisingly, Scrapper which is remotely controlled by Sheo comes to help. Scrappers help take the missile launcher and weld it into Gypsy Avenger's hands. They fly including Scrapper which gets stuck in the back of Gypsy Avenger. From above, Gypsy gets ready to hit Mega Kaiju using plasma shots aiming Gypsy's fist right at Mega Kaiju. Gypsy falls at high speed. On the other hand, there is damage that makes Jake and the Manny unable to get out of the Gypsy cockpit. Luckily, Scrapper is there to help them get into Scrapper. Right before Mega Kaiju enters the crater of Fuji, Gypsy Avenger hits it at a high speed. There is quite a large shockwave. Mega Kaiju is seen getting revived, but not long after that, Mega Kaiju is dead. Everyone cheers at their victory. Elsewhere, Nate manages to catch Newton. Jake and the Manny manage to survive thanks to Sheo's help. Inside the headquarters, Newton, who was possessed by Precursors, gives a warning that Precursors would not stop there and would continue to come to Earth sooner or later. Jake then comes into the room and talks to the Precursor inside Newton's head, saying that he doesn't need to bother coming to the Earth as later they will come to him. So here it goes, the Pacific Rim Part 2. Thank you to those who have watched from start to finish. Please like this video if you enjoy it and don't forget to click subscribe. See you in the next video.